Welcome back to the Afters Hotline. It's event day. It is event day. Exciting. Event day. Switch number three beat Luke Dean and Little Fritter. And little Fritter. We don't see him, we're a bit run down, but we're very excited. It's going to be a massive show. How are you guys feeling? Excited, yeah. As you said, very run down. The voice is gone. I think I've passed on my sickness to Brody over here. Mm. But it's going to be a big one. It should be well over a thousand people. Um, first international headliner, Luke Dean, who's obviously popping off. And then Little Fritter as well, who's just, just about everywhere at the minute and doing huge shows everywhere. So exciting night ahead. How are you Brody. feeling, Chief? <sighs> I wish I was feeling 100% A. Eh? Really, really looking forward to this one, but it's just annoying that a bit run down, a bit under the weather, but it is what it is. Welcome. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Cheers, Sean. For no worries. No one forced you to come to Queensland with us and sit next to me on a plane and stuff. Oh, whoa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If whoa, you didn't want whoa, me there, you should have just said so. He didn't sit next to you on the plane. <laughs> it's figure of speech. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's all about the perception. Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> anyway, look, we're all feeling a bit under the weather, but I thought... Get spirits the, are high, but spirits is very spirits high. Are high. Spirits are high, but. spirits are very high. But I thought we'd play a little game today. Yes, get us going a bit. So I've brought Media Girl. Pick hey. up Laura. Pick up the Laura. Media Girl in the back. She's lagging. Oh, she's too busy on her phone. You're fired. <laughs> I'm actually too busy filtering out all the crew disgusting. Yeah, so yeah. some of the questions are a little bit. She's uh, chosen them, by the way. Yeah. So <laughs> if, if anything you don't like. Blame Direct your inquiries to at Laura Knowles. Yeah, at Laura Knowles at utopicevents.com. <laughs> Media girl at Utopic Events. Yeah. All right, we're going to play. It's called what's it called Rock, Rock in a Hard Place. Oh, who used to say that at school? Was it McGuinness? Yeah, Rock in a Hard Place. Sounds like something they'd say. I'm, I swear. I, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was McGuinness. Mm. He had some good stories. Don, donkey in the World. The donkey in the World. The sticks. Oh, yeah, the sticks. sticks was bundle of sticks. A bundle of sticks. Exactly. He was a great man. If you had that one downfall. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. I don't know if you've just seen that. We've got a ghost in the room. Maybe it's from that. <laughs> yeah, from the question. question <laughs> right. All right. I think she's finally ready. Oh, Archie's here. Yeah, they've given me a terrible setup here. I, I can't. I it's can't not move. very ergonomic, but we move. <laughs> you ready, media girl? Archie. Archie. Yeah, hold on. I need some hands. I'm struggling here. All right, first one. Would you rather have a finger as a tongue or have tongues as fingers? Finger. <laughs> Wait, like finger, finger as a tongue, like tongue. Oh, tongue. Oh, tongue. tongue. Sorry, it's the accent. The accent. <laughs> finger as a tongue or tongue as fingers. Finger. Wait, so your fingers are tongues? Yeah. Oh, no. So you have 10 tongues oh. on your hands. Or you have tongue. a finger <laughs> as your tongue. Ah, oh, you fucked the other way. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> nah, <laughs> bro, imagine <laughs> going to like shake hands with someone and <laughs> it's just tongue. <laughs> nah. imagine, imagine trying to kiss someone in here. It's a finger. Oh. <laughs> I'd probably go the, the, the tongues as fingers. I wonder if they've got taste buds. Because imagine touching everything, you can just taste oh, everything. Oh, yeah. But have you heard this thing where you can look at something and without even having ever you know lived it, it you know exactly yeah. Yeah. how it would taste and how it would feel. Yeah. How weird yeah. that? Cap. Just on the back <laughs> no, <of> it. <laughs> no, no. Would you rather have... I've seen something. Would you rather have fingers for legs or legs for fingers? What? Would you rather have fingers for legs? <laughs> fingers? So imagine you got like a, a, a leg. Yeah, it's like a little stump. Or but that's not even a stump. That's just straight like... Yeah. Yeah. Or oh, well, that, fingers crazy. for legs or legs for fingers. Or legs for fingers. You're fucked either way. Mm. I couldn't have... You probably uh, couldn't... Like, legs for fingers is just too big. How do you do anything? Yeah, with legs for fingers, it has to be the other way. Mm. As long as they're strong enough. But how do you walk? Very slow. You probably couldn't, I don't think. You probably couldn't. Look at Archie. I'm going to go with the... I'm going to go with the tongue, the tongue for fingers. No, yeah. I'm going fingers Finger. for tongues. <laughs> Every time you talk about it, there's a finger in your mouth <laughs> moving around. <laughs> yeah, but I think I'd rather before. that than like five slimy things on my hand, like touching everything. Wouldn't it be convenient when you want to grab something either? Mm. Anyway, no. next one, next one, next one. Next Moving one. on. <coughs> Would you rather know every bad thing everyone thinks about you Ooh. or have everyone know every bad thing you think Ooh. about them? Ooh. Everyone, everyone knows what I think about 
Actually, no, nah, fuck, I want to know what other people think. Yeah, yeah. know what other people think. Yeah. And yeah. then you know who's true or not, but then that would hurt if someone you're close with was thinking bad things about you. It would hurt, but I think yeah. it's way better than every everyone time knowing you, yeah, what yeah. you're thinking. Yeah, yeah. definitely yeah. right. Get out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> What are you saying? <laughs> Would you rather drool every time you talk? I already do that. <laughs> <laughs> or shit yourself every time you sneeze? Oh, drool. Oh, drool. 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 That's pretty <laughs> fucked. I wouldn't sneeze. Oh, <laughs> here he is. Here he is. What a hero. Yeah, is, can, can you, can I can sometimes you can't help sneeze. So if I go, does that count as a sneeze? Yes. Like if I hold it in? Yeah. 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 There's uh, no controlling sneezing. I just, I'd be trying to. <laughs> yeah. You can't, you can't have drooling every time you talk. That's fucked. <laughs> that's fucking... That's not good. <laughs> Drool. Just, just wear a nappy. Yeah, I just wear a nappy. Shit when I sneeze. You wear a nappy? Is there gonna, what if you're doing a bucket bar gig and the sun's setting and the sun catches your eyes so it's like a nice day and you, uh, and you shit yourself. Got a nappy on. <laughs> yeah, I'll sweat it. No one can smell it. <laughs> I gotta go to the bathroom. <laughs> Dump and do nappy. what? Dump my nappy. <laughs> <laughs> Get the wet wipes out. And then you sneeze again. Put another nappies on. Pause. What was the first one? Oh, drool. Drooling. No, it drew. It can't you drool. Can't, uh, nah, you can't. But I don't want to shit myself every time I sneeze. Well, you can't. No one. You could never have a serious conversation. In a while. <laughs> Imagine you're trying to close a multi. It's, like, it's every time you talk. <clears throat> Imagine you're trying to close a multi-million dollar deal or a multi-billion dollar deal, <laughs> and you're some big business icon, and you're just fucking salivating. Probably wouldn't get there so for that reason. I don't yeah. sneeze every day. Yeah. Neither I, do I. I don't sneeze too often. Yeah. I, I hardly sneeze. I'm yeah. nah. Mm. I'd rather draw. <laughs> How much <laughs> shit? Yeah, well, it's just like a. <laughs> You're giving into this too much now. <laughs> what right. kind of shit are we I'm doing? Gonna sh- <laughs> Solid. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm gonna go shit. This lady's present. <laughs> I couldn't I couldn't shit myself. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm I'm drooling. <laughs> Didn't you say before you? Uh, you stay out of the meetings then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we got two submissions. <coughs> got a submission from Tyra. Big up, Tyra. My question is: If you could play anywhere, any venue in the world, what venue would you play, and why? What did I think? I I, I was thinking about this the other day. Where was it? What venue? Mm. Mm. Ah, fuck! I had an answer. Warehouse project. Oh yes. I don't know if this is the one I'd most want to play, but I was thinking about this the other day and how sick it would be because the vibes in there and the music gets played in one of those another churches when they do like a church. Yeah, event. I reckon that'd be fucking sick. Mm. I was watching a few streams last night. I'm gonna say that just because I reckon that'd be sick. A vibe, music on point. Fuck. It'd be somewhere in the UK. In I warehouse project. Mm. Pasha, FIFA. <sighs> it's not like pretty much like one one that I want to play. Like it's fucking unreal. But um, venue or, or party? Venue, venue. M- uh, Amnesia Terrace. Yeah, Amnesia Terrace. Yeah. I reckon that'd be D- fucking. DC insane. Ten Terrace would be sick as well. I'd rather Amnesia. DC Ten Courtyard. I reckon I'd rather play the Terrace than the Courtyard for sure. Yeah, I'll I'll go for an, an like a church, like in an another event, or Amnesia Terrace. Also, big up Julian Wood and Angus Kyle correcting us on yeah, yeah pronunciation. Yeah, thank you, boys. We, another we'd been calling them Anoda for a long time. <laughs> um, I reckon Warehouse Project that de- de- depot is that what it's called. It's Concourse Depot Mayfield. Depot. Mm. They're, they're the rooms. Any oh. anywhere in there be fucked. Yeah. I reckon Amnesia Terrace. <laughs> <laughs> tough question. It fucking oh, great tough question. one though. Printworks maybe. Printworks Ooh. would be fucking sick. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what? Let's let's go Amnesia Terrace. Amnesia Terrace. Yeah. That'd be. And what are you going with? Well, I'm stumped. Oregon Warehouse Project Depot. Switch at Selena's. <laughs> Selena's, yeah. Right. Selena's, Selena's, obviously. Place Off. to be. Where All else right. is it? Is there yeah. anywhere else in yeah. Spain? Berlin, I probably wouldn't. Paris, so fabric would be fabric. Happy. Madrid, uh, fabric, yeah, yeah. It looks mental. Well, apparently, yeah, Bastion said a few thousand people you get in there. Five thousand or something. Yeah, something. I feel like it was even. That's bright speaking. Oh, it was more. Yeah, yeah, eight thousand or something. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like double the size of horn. Have we gone from Finn as well. Oh, what was the fucking um, thing that space put up? Yeah, I saw that. 
come back. I don't think privilege is ready though. No, nah, it wouldn't probably, be. Yeah. 2025, probably. I did say that. I have to go mm. back. I wonder what events I'll do there. My residencies. I reckon Elro will go there next oh, year. Ah, yeah, you're saying that they, they need bigger. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's the biggest club in the world. Oh, biggest. Elro will probably. go to privilege, yeah. Yeah. Fuck. Across the road. That'd be insane. That's right. across the road, isn't it? Finn, your boy. Big up Finn. Uh, this one's from Finn. Big up the Finn. Fion. Finn. How's it going, boys? My question is, who is your dream back-to-back -back with? Who do you want to go back-to-back -back with? Ooh. Ooh. Cheers, boys. Fuck, that's a good question. I, I, oh, it's, so, it's so hard. I will go to the I've got. You got two? Yeah. Stussy, <coughs> Stussy number one. I reckon that would just be off chops. And then another would be the other one. But it's hard. Like, oh. Archie would be fucking mad. I feel like it'd be similar answers to what? Tough you questions. Set out top three acts for a festival. Mm. But yeah, they're Stussy mine. would be a, a big one. Tunes he would have. It'd be St yeah, Stussy, Coulter. Coulter would be cool. It's so hard. Like, there's so many fucking great DJs over there. Um, hmm. I'm stumped. But yeah, Stussy or another for me. I think mm, Stussy would definitely be up there. Dennis Cruz would be a big ball of energy. He would be good. Or a little ball of energy. <laughs> Corolla. Corolla would be And back to back with him would be fucked. Yeah, he's fucking elite. Jamie Jones. Yeah. Elite. Oh, fuck. All right, fuck it. Enough name and cool DJs. Just pick, pick one. <sighs> I'm going to go Dennis Cruz. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Dennis Cruz or... Oh, fuck. Go yeah, Dennis, Dennis, Dennis Cruz. Dennis Cruz. Yeah, baby. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just for the... Just for the... Um, the nostalgia as well. Yeah. He's just... Yeah. Ginormous. Yeah. It's a good shout. Yeah. So who'd you go? Stussy. 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 Play whatever. You know, you can play whatever too because he'll play whatever. Yeah. yeah. So Stussy, baby, Dennis. Dennis Cruz. Solid picks. Good question though. Very good question. Big up the Big, Finn. Big up Finn. All right, we're going to get stuck into the episode now with Cassette. Hope you guys enjoy. Adios. Welcome back for another episode of The Beat. Today we're joined by Sydney House Music Royalty Cassette. How's it going? Good, thank you. What's been happening? Uh, we were just talking about it's release day. Hey. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Caleb Jackson, a very um, talented local producer who you all know, um, who's getting assigned to some big labels like Elro and bunch of cool little underground labels too but yeah he um we started cooking up this idea maybe two or three months ago and yeah he he really put like the finishing touches on it and it's like yeah so it got released today on sweaters records which is exciting and it's already getting good feedback from jamie, jamie jones and divine who else who else was <laughs> he it? did show me this today i can't remember but there's a few there's a few big names in there yeah it's exciting yeah. Debut release, first release? Yeah. So I have a lot of other tracks, but unreleased. So, yeah, no, we were saying hopefully this is the momentum to get them all released. Yeah. Where'd the idea come from behind the track? Because obviously the, the uh, whole gospel theme behind it. So I found this gospel sample. Um, Austin, La Austin Lade, you know that DJ Austin Lade? Yeah. He, play, he, he played a track at Burning Man. Um, at the camp. So my, my sister started this camp called Bang Bang and they had a big party one night and Lee Burridge and Austin Lardy played. And Austin Lardy played um, this track that had the, like a, a gospel sample in it and then I was asking him about it after and he's like, oh, I just bought the sample and then loped it over like another track that I had. And then I went and found like some other samples by the same gospel artist. Um, it's called Le Chien, Le Chien Pace. And actually, Nico Jars sampled um, some of her stuff before. Um, a few other artists have. It's just like it's like that real, you know, deep feels black gospel kind of stuff. So then, me and Caleb downloaded the the a few of those, and then we found one that was different to the ones everyone else has used. And In the um, beginning, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we just started chopping it up together, like just in his living room. Like he was, he was. 
Yeah, he wasn't even working out of his studio at the time. He was just working out of his living room and, you know, then he started putting different beats to it and um, I think once he kind of, once he fleshed out the breakdown, the rest all fell into place from there because the, the breakdown's epic with the, you know, the mm. soulful gospel. I played it at Subsonic and it went off um, and I played it at Breakfast Club and it did well. And, yeah, it's getting great feedback. I, I need to actually check my phone to see who else was, it was he, that... I think you put up a story. Let me quickly check. Yeah. Today of saying early support from... So someone else. See, someone else put that story up. I think it might have been Caleb, yeah. So... Because <clears throat> I was rushing to get ready around that time I saw that post. I didn't get a chance to read it. Early support from Jamie Jones, Clapton, Robosonic, Della Swing, Frank Rosado, Paco Asuna, Roger Sanchez, Sam Devine. Oh, sick. Sanchez is a good company there. Sanchez is a good one. Yeah. 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 yeah Frankie Rosado. And Paco Asuna, I love, I love yeah, him. Yeah, he's a G. Yeah. So many good tracks. I've got, so I've got tracks of his dating back to like 2008. Like, even earlier, that are just bombs, like, absolute weapons. Like, you still play them now, and, like, no one else is playing them. No one they don't, No one knows what they are. They don't come up in Shazam, but they're just, no matter if the dance floor is dying, you, you play that, and it's just, Gets like, it back. back on. Yes, yeah, it's yeah. game on again. So he's just, he's just all time. So when did you get into music, then, and DJing? 2000, uh, around 2008, then? So it would have been... Yeah, maybe it was around then. Maybe maybe a year or two later. I can't actually remember now. It's been like so long. So I started in radio and music events, um, working for Fuzzy, the festival. Like they used to put on festivals, Park Life, Harbour Life, Field Day. Um, and they used to run sounds on Sunday at the Greenwood. And I was doing, like, radio, like, Sunset Radio and FBI. I was producing that um, for a DJ who ended up dying, um, Ajax. But he was, like, you know, amazing DJ. You guys probably heard of him. Um, and then, yeah, I was, I was booking all the DJs and, and I was working in tours and events and just kind of doing a bit of everything. And it was just uh, – I worked at Fuzzy for, I think, it was five years. And then towards the end, I, I just – I was thinking like, wow, these DJs get paid so much more than me and they don't really have to do anything. I'm like, this <laughs> is <laughs> pretty good <laughs> after five years in events. And by then, like, I knew everyone and um, everyone had been telling me, oh, you should be a DJ, you should be a DJ. Because sometimes you would book these DJs and then they would come in and they wouldn't even do a good job and it was just so frustrating because it's like, how could they think that that would be the right song to play now and I'm not one of those chin stroker critical people I'm actually very like not like that but um yeah there's there were times when it just felt like they weren't even like they didn't even try and then I thought oh, I could actually do this a lot better <laughs> not that it's not that it's a competition because it's not music <laughs> is definitely not competitive edge but that was definitely like i definitely and then there were other sets that i saw by other lots of locals and internationals where i was like wow you know he did such an amazing job and then that's that's more inspiring than someone not doing a good job obviously <laughs> but um yeah i was around music and nightclubs like pretty much since i was like 15 yeah so there was always that passion. 15 yeah, like I had my real, my older real. sister and my <laughs> older cousins, I do, and yeah, so, and back then, like, they just, it wasn't, like, as strict as it is now, like, so they used to just take one look at me and um, they'd be like, okay, well, she's obviously underage, so we'll just let her straight through, and, uh, like, <laughs> now... <laughs> Instead of the opposite, <laughs> she's <laughs> obviously <laughs> underage. <laughs> it's very different now, now you have to get the scan, like, yeah, you're going through airport security, it's crazy, <laughs> but... But, yeah, like, my sister was dating a DJ, my cousin was as well. Like, they were very entrenched in the clubs and so I used to just go with them and um, I kind of liked it straight away. But but I think, like, I didn't really start properly clubbing until I was, like, yeah, like, maybe, like... 18. Oh, yeah, 18, 19, <laughs> 20. Not, it's properly more like clubbing. Of age. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. So there was always that passion for music there. Is that yes. why you got into that radio and Yeah. Well, at first actually I thought I wanted to work in fashion. So I was working in fashion events. I did all this work experience for um InStyle, which I think doesn't actually exist anymore. 
in Style Magazine, but it used to be one of the big ones. And then um, Spin Communications, who run Fashion Week, and I thought I wanted to work in fashion events. Um, so I did that for like a little bit, and then I was thinking, oh, this is a bit like fickle for me, and the music, the mu- music was calling to me more, and then that's when I applied to kind of do an internship with FBI and then it was through that that I got the job at Fuzzy and then everything just um, rolled on from there. And what were you playing when you first started DJing? Uh, It wasn't really that different to be honest. Like if anything it's probably gone more back to that sound now. Like that kind of, I was always into a bit of breaks, a bit of old school house, you know, a little bit of liquidy drum and bass, like you know, I really like that old school sound, which doesn't really date. Um, and as long as you mix it in with enough new stuff, so it's still, you know, appealing to everyone. Because that's the thing, I do like to play lots of different styles of house. And um, I feel like that's why I've been able to play for so many different brands and parties, because that is actually my style, like that Midland kind of style. You know, I like those UK TJs that play a bit of everything, you know, play a bit of Afro house, play a bit of old school house, bit of breaks like all through one set. As long as you do it tastefully and put it all together in a nice way, I think it's it's that's kind of how I like to play. Do you think your sound stayed along that trajectory the whole career? Because you were saying you sort of came back to where it began now. Did it waver off into different sections throughout the last 15 years or do you think it was always sort of around the same realm of house music? I think at certain points it got a lot more minimal and a lot more underground um, because I was playing so much for Sash and I was playing all these minimal um, parties and I feel like minimal was also really big at one point Mm, and then people got a bit sick of it. Um, I got a bit sick of it too. Like I still like it but um, I feel like after COVID – People had had just such a depresso couple of years and everything had been a bit like, oh, you know, when is this going to end? And then um, when it did finally end, I feel like, you know, that uplifting house sound was really like Never primed to up, come usually. back like in a big way and it did. And I was noticing, well, that when Danny and I started bodywork during COVID, that was our motivation for bodywork because... We felt like none of the parties we were going to were playing the music we really wanted to hear. Like we wanted to hear not generic house, but we wanted to hear good house that made us want to dance. And so like, um, you know, sometimes you go to these warehouse parties or whatever and it just feels like it felt like everyone was trying to outdo each other with who's got the most unreleased tracks. But, you know... You know, at the expense of the dance floor because it's like if you're just trying to play all unreleased vinyl, then, like, there's only so much good music that comes out in a period that hasn't been released yet. And then if you're looking back at a catalogue over, like, 15, 20 years and you don't mind that it's already released, then you can put together a much better set. So, yeah, so that was kind of our inspiration for Bodywork, that music, that cool house music um, that's not generic, that makes people want to dance. Not like going off on all these, you know, tangents and stuff. Because also the, it was getting a bit hectic with all the police and the regulations as well. So we're like, we need to move away from this more druggy music and try and <laughs> find something that's a bit of a happy medium. Just on body work, you started out with your good friend, Danny B, who just mentioned. Um, what's your relationship with Danny? How did you guys sort of get to meet? We've obviously had Danny on here last year. We're chatting a bit about you guys, how close you are, but from your perspective, how did that relationship start? Uh, so Danny and I have been friends for years. We actually met the, for the first time through a Sash event and that was like years ago when Sash was at the Abercrombie and um, that we played like they had like an all girls Sash day or whatever where it was all girl DJs and it was like... Um, me, her, another girl, Amy, who's moved to Berlin and she's doing well over there now. Um, Gabby as well, I think. And, yeah, we all had the best day. It was really busy and, like, they all played so good. I met her that day and we've been friends ever since. She ended up moving to Berlin um, and working for SoundCloud and then I remember we kept in touch and then every time I went to Berlin, I stayed with her and we'd, like, have the best time. She'd, like, we'd go to every Big party. Sessions. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're kind of, like, similar energy. Like, we just want to go everywhere. And like yin and yang. 
Yeah, and she we have a similar sense of humour and um, we always get along with the same kind of people. So, yeah, we just always kept in touch and stayed good friends. And then when she moved back to Sydney, it just seemed like the perfect time to start something because we'd been going out a lot together, but um, I didn't feel like any of the parties were, like, making me... I just wanted to dance and I didn't feel like any of the sets were really inspiring me to dance enough. I think one of the big things or one of the main things or artists I can think of coming out of that COVID period was Fred again with... Oh, uh, yeah. Maria. We lost dancing, yeah. that one with the Blessed Madonna. I think that's what... Before he popped off, popped off. I think that's sort of mm. what, it, what got He's him. He's so yeah, big that's now, isn't he? Fred yeah. Mania. Yeah, that's what. That's how I knew Fred again from that track. Yeah, it's fucking interesting. Take the first time I've like really thought about that as far as people wanting to dance after COVID because that nineties house sound is just rampant everywhere yeah. right now. Like it's just feel good. Yeah, like, feel good. Like yeah, that's the thing. You have the power as a DJ to really change the mood of the room and to uplift people if if you can. And I I always try to do that if I can. Mm. Um, you know, you obviously you know you have to take them on a bit of a journey. It can't just be like one uplifting bomb after another, but. But just definitely you want that vibe at the end of the set. Just on that as well, I think it was just before that massive second lockdown we were at Sash watching yeah. you at breakfast. <laughs> oh, that was um, a good one. <laughs> was it? Uh, it was funny if I had everybody. Everybody's free. Yeah, yeah. 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 that old 90s <laughs> anthem. Yeah, that, that was, was a scene. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was. And, and <laughs> I sent the video. <laughs> I left before. Little we did we know that we were all about to get locked down again for oh, another true. two months. Yeah. It was right before that, so it's interesting. But um, we were all happy to feel free at that moment because we'd been on and off lockdown for two years. That was a great session. Yeah. What if yeah. you've obviously been at Sash for so long? You sort of. A staple there. What have been some of your favourite moments at Sash? Um, that was definitely probably my, one of my favourites, if not the favourite. Because um, normally that set would go to an international, but mm. at the time, um, because they couldn't fly internationals in because of COVID, it, it went to me. Huge gig. So that was, that was, yeah, and I played for four hours that morning and it was cranking till the very end, which I think was midday. I'd need a bathroom break. <laughs> <laughs> well, I slept and then went in fresh. Um I think we did stay oh. till the end, didn't and we? And I didn't we take a bathroom time. break. Yeah, it's funny when you're high on adrenaline, you don't need one. Yeah, because that was when you played at label, and I think you were there the night before playing at label yeah. the night before as well. I have a vague Yeah, I don't yeah. remember. We actually I met you remember. Was that there. the Scotty yeah. Cow night? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, it wasn't that busy when I was there, but I think mm. I had to leave. I had to play early because I had, you had to go home and get some sleep. the next day, I think. Yeah, yeah. probably. Was that? Very versatile. Opening one party and then closing. Closing yeah. the biggest party breakfast. at the time. Well, the yeah, sash was definitely the more important gig, so I was like, have to prioritise that. Yeah, I don't think label was the night before, though, was it? No, well, I, I think it, it was, think it was a couple British. nights before. No, it was the night before. Cause oh, no, because oh. we didn't, yeah, because we, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, the night before we went, we went out that night to. That was we got the house. No, we stayed there. We stayed in the Airbnb. <laughs> yeah, we, we, left, we got yeah. an Airbnb in the city, and we went straight to Sash, pretty much. Yeah, and we oh, stayed right yeah. to the we stayed right to the end. Actually, that one. Nice. Yeah, that was a good one. All the other breakfasts we've left early, but that one we actually stayed to the end. Oh, like credit to yourself. DJ guys. was killing oh, it, so we stayed. <laughs> credit to yourself. Doing something. Um, like. There was a few other good Sash ones. Um, like a Sash is always good, really. Mm. Um, a, a long weekend. Yeah, yeah. The, the Enzo won last year, that, and then there was one with Josh Baker and Rich Next as well last year. That was yeah. sick too. Yeah, yeah. The, the long weekends there, they unmatched. Yeah, they can't yeah. beat that. Yeah. And Danny and I hosted that um, side room as bodywork. You know that other glass side room? It kind of looks mm. like the terrace, but it's yeah. underneath. Yep. Um, and that was sick. Yeah, there was one that we hosted where we both played with us. There was another we hosted where. Um, Kelly T played with us, and um, they were both really epic. Like, yeah, like it's always it full house, always proper vibes. Yeah. 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 Did you play Subsonic recently as part of Sash? Or was no, that just so we didn't play the Sash stage. We played um, the Parrot. We played the same stage, which is Paradiso, but it was Sash on the Sunday, and then it was Subsonic on the Saturday, um, and. Originally, we were supposed to play the Sash stage on the Sunday, but because they had two internationals, um, we would have had to have played a much earlier set time. So we kind of made the decision to play the Saturday because we would get to play later to more uh, more people. 
but yeah, we were there the whole time on the Sash Sunday as well, and that was epic. That was with Quest and Laidlaw, yeah. and that was one of my funnest. Um, yeah, that was probably what my funnest day of the festival. Obviously, other than our set. There was a bit of a story with the set as well. Was there lightning or something midway through and everyone came back yeah. to the dance floor or something? Do you want to tell yeah, us about that? Yeah, was, it was so crazy. So it had been like so hot, man. Like it had been like, it was like th- over 36, I think. Like almost close to 40. And it was um, right when we had to play, it was like the hottest peak. And li- Lily was playing before us and like it was going off. Like she was playing the best day, it was full. Uh, but it was like peak heat and um, like that jungle heat as well. Like mm. just super thick and sweaty. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, But people were still frothing, you know. And um, it was definitely a vibe. And then when we came on... We played like th- three or four tracks and it was just starting to heave and then um, this like huge crack of thunder came and then the whole sky opened up and it started raining and then they had to close down the whole stage because apparently the lightning and the stage is steel and all this uh, stuff. It's like a safety mm. thing and we're like, no, and Danny actually started crying. Oh, <laughs> oh, yeah, it was really funny. And then um, – and then – we, they're like, don't worry, you can come back on as soon as the lightning moves enough kilometres away. And then when we when we came back on, I think it was maybe like half an hour later. So, yeah, so Litmus, Marley, or it was almost an hour later, Litmus, Marley, Thank You City, and one other artist who I can't remember at the moment. I think it was actually just those three. They all agreed to give us give up some of their set time so that oh, we so could right. play a full set, which was really sweet. That's sick. Yeah, um, yeah especially because they've, like, Litmus and Molly had flown all the way from overseas and um, Thank You City had flown from Melbourne. So that was really nice. They kind of – they were almost going to give us less time, um, the festival, and then the artists banded together so that we could play a full set. That's oh, sick. that's nice. Which was really cool. Yeah. And Yeah, so such a nice moment. And then, um, and then, yeah, it was so funny. Like, we just pressed play on the first track because obviously the stage has been closed for an hour. Everyone's gone back to their – things because it was fully raining but then as soon as it stopped raining yeah. the sky opened up and it was all sunny and wonderful and yeah. like not as hot anymore and um just like like literally like 20 seconds into the first track it was like all these people just appeared out of nowhere and then it was just packed the energy but again the energy would have been insane hey I yeah f- I, f- I feel like whenever for whatever reason like the music cuts or something yeah. happens yeah. then you come back and then the energy everyone's just rare yeah people were so. so up for it like there were some people that missed our set because they didn't get back in time but there was also like it was full like it was busy yeah and then at the end like we got like a full like you know applause like a 10 minute applause that was sick <laughs> you yeah. played at subsonic a few times haven't you yeah yeah I've, regular yeah some of my best sets i think have been at subsonic how'd you get the relationship going with subsonic to be able to play there a few times um i just went there and like just immersed myself in it and like um I think I was also kind of playing everywhere else at the time as well. So it's like they already kind of knew me. You're on their radar. Um, like that's kind of how I got, got gigs everywhere was I was just there. Like, you know, I just – all I wanted to do was go out and dance and listen to music. That's all I wanted. So it wasn't like I'm like asking for a gig but not supporting the party. Like mm-hmm. I was always there. So – like they easier. couldn't forget about me. <laughs> <laughs> like, there she is again. Maybe we should give her a gig. <laughs> you know, sympathy like, gig. <laughs> that one's a sympathy no, gig. I'm kidding. I think I'm kidding, I'm kidding. It's Jesus. more just that they know that, you know, I was there well, uh, and supporting. I understood the party. I understood the vibe. I was hanging out with all the other people that played. And, you know, like if someone asks me to play body work but they've never been to a body work, it's kind of just like, well. Yeah, why should we? Yeah, that's kind of how I feel and that's how I, I understand everyone else would feel. I think if you've been going there and supporting the party and you understand the vibe and you understand mm. what tracks work, don't work at what time, then then you're going to be able to play a good set. But if you've never been there before, then it can go either way. Yeah, I think it's good to support the party that you want to play at. Like obviously you can't get to every party and whatnot, but you should at least show your face. If, if you want to message the page, especially if they're a local party, you know, it's important yeah. to get around the party and support Big it. Big time. Otherwise you're just asking, like the, the, there are a lot of like young DJs coming through. Not just young. I don't think it's an age thing actually. 
but they just like expect it like it just to fall in their lap and mm. it's like Gonna you know, DJs ask me all the time, young up and comers, like, oh, what's your advice for like breaking into the scene? And my advice is always the same like, support the parties you want to play, be there, like, not in an annoying way, but be there in a true, genuine way where you're actually enjoying the event and observing the event and create your own events, create your own community. And then that's actually what promoters respond to because then they see that you've got a following. Like, you know, you guys created your own parties you know you've created your own podcast so you're building your own following there's nothing more attractive to a promoter than that we'll have, we'll have you in at some stage yeah, yeah for sure yeah like the setup looks like i was like what is this venue when i first saw the video because it's like i've never um seen anyone else doing anything cool there you know it's yeah bad. If it's good yeah, not, it's a not sick setup. Yeah, all by society. It's, <laughs> it's good. Yeah, it's but, good. But like when you go in there without our setup, like it, it looks completely different to what it is. Like if we just took a video and sent it to you of of when like our stage and stuff is moved out, it looks way different. And then when we've got everything set up, it just yeah, it it without not meaning to brag, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It is, yeah. So how did the setup come about? We just sort of wanted to do something that wasn't being done in. Sydney or Australia um, and obviously we like we've been lucky to travel to Europe and like see the clubs over there as well and we kind of thought what can we do that emulates that and emula- like it's going to give you a proper European vibe like obviously Kerry with Carousel that's very European but that's more stripped back than we wanted we wanted like a in between of like a cool like fresh approach of like a European club kind of thing and then we just thought yeah we'll get um, we need something unique for the setup and then at the time with like budgets and stuff and our first idea was to have like the red spectrum lighting that we had for the first events but now when we um the last couple months we've done like the pin lights and they move around the the center it's just like like something unique and it's not really something that you could emulate without it being known like looking like it's sort of copying us as well like wanted to make it so when people see the setup they know that's our party like kind of infamous for that vibe and that um it's the music policy as well. We just wanted it to be re- this good house music, really. We're okay, happy to do a bit of techno here and there if it's the right act, but generally I think house has been a bit pushed to the side mm. in the last couple of years, like especially on the younger demo. and so ravey stuff. I think a lot of the younger demographic, this like now, they don't know what they like. So it's kind of just showing them. Like they, they think, I agree. They think they, think they, they like, know. yeah, they think they like the, like the techno and ravey stuff, which they do, but. I think people don't give them enough credit. Like when I played um, at the Abercrombie for this return to Rio party, like a a few weeks back, I can't remember, maybe like a month or so. And, um, you know, you're probably thinking, oh, return to Rio crowd's different to Abercrombie. But you could tell, like I've played Rio (laughs) for years and, you know, there was so many people there that weren't there for the Rio brand. They were obviously just people that come to Abercrombie that were like, oh, so what's going on here, you know, and they just rocked up and they were pretty young, um, but they, I was playing like cool kind of, un, like, you know, definitely like a, a bit of a different kind of set, like not that hard, fast, ravey sound and um, they were responding really well to it. I was actually quite surprised by like the tracks they were really responding to. So I think that, you know, they are into cool music, but you just got to showcase it for them in a way that, where they don't get bored. You just have to give it to them, really. <laughs> like, that's the thing. I, yeah. Every new party these days, not to shit on them or anything, but everything new is, like, the ravey, techno, TikTok-y. Like, so I think tracks. they don't really kind of know. Like, they know they like going out and clubbing and dance music, but they don't know because they're being, like, if you, I'm not, obviously, you think of a few parts of the top of my head, the music that's being played, that's kind of their first clubbing experience. And that's if that's all you know, then you're not going to know any different. But I think it's like good for them to come to events and see the verse or go to the, the range of different events. Like if you're going to Sash, but then you're also going to Lost, but then you're also going to XYZ party, you're getting a range of different genres and you can pick what you want from there. Mm. Whereas a lot of the new parties like Sean said that are popping up, they're very like hard groove, hard techno. And when it swings back around, they're kind of going to, there's going to be like, it's, cause eventually it's going to shelf life will deteriorate for that sound as well. So it's, they're going to be in this spot where they thought they like this kind of music and there's not it's not really around anymore. That's why I think it's good to always play a bit of everything because it's like the venue don't get pigeonholed for one. And 
I think all the best DJs do. Like, have you guys ever seen Sven Bath play? Like, you know, he start like, when he played Days Like This when I was working for um, Division Agency. And, you know, he's just such a pro. Like, after watching that set, I realised, like, why he's just, like, so... Been around. You know, for been a, like, he's so nice to everyone. Like, even just, you know, it's down to, like, the staff, just the door staff or whatever. And... You know, he played all vinyl and he started with this kind of like Afro housey, congery kind of sound and then he slowly built it into a techno set. It wasn't like he just went straight into the techno set and he's dancing and he's full showman and he's, you know, like he's mixing vinyl but it's like it's just so second nature to him that he can just kind of still be that um, show pony guy. And, yeah, like I thought, oh, that's a real... DJ, you know, like he knows how to build, knows how to build the set and he knows how to draw them in so that they don't get tired. And, you know, it did get a bit too hectic for me at the end because I'm not into full on techno, but I really, really enjoyed the first half, like way more than I thought I would. How long was the set? Oh, I think it was just like two and a half hours, yeah. three hours, maybe. Maybe got three hours, I can't remember. Good time to take you on a bit of a journey, three hours. So. Yeah, it was. he was so good. I was so impressed. Like N- Nina, like all respect to Nina because, you know, I think she's also like, you know. She's full, crazy. She's a full power <laughs> bitch and I love that. Too, you know, <laughs> like she's done so well and, you know, she is legit. But, um, but her actual sound is just that little bit too hard for me in terms of what she plays at a gig, not what she makes. Um. So, yeah, there was a couple of times because Division toured her quite a few times and um, there was, I remember I warmed up for her once at this Greenwood um, day thing and then, then we ran the after party too and we were kind of looking after her like, like throughout the day and um, she was really nice and everything. I've heard people say that she isn't but she was to me. She, she was speak really much sweet. English. Hmm? She speak full English? Yeah. She doesn't say much but she's. She could definitely speak f- like very clear, fluent English, from what I, from what I, my com- what I spoke with her about. Um, I think she didn't. She didn't want too many people coming up and talking to her. She felt comfortable with me. She felt comfortable with Scott. Uh, maybe because I'm a female, and there was just so many dudes around, you mm. know. Like, um, but. I was also, you know, really, like, stoked to be meeting her because she's, like, such a big dog in the industry and, like, you know, I look up to her, I admire her, you know, I was, like, very, like, and she could feel that too. So, you know, she probably liked that. But, um, but yeah, the thing is, like, she was lovely, she was cool, she played heaps of cool old legit techno tracks that, like I said, it was, like, the respect. But by the end of the full day and full night it was just so much techno yeah. for me in my ears like I was just like exhausted you know techno now so yeah it was <laughs> too much techno <laughs> for me <laughs> oh, I need a groove like. <laughs> yeah so you've been in the scene for a minute now whether it's between working with Fuzzy and uh, at the beginning or DJing what's the biggest changes you've noticed from when you started to now in the scene um just that um it's gotten so hard to like make money off parties um as a promoter i think because the market is so flooded and when i was working at fuzzy like this kind of bidding war started with all the touring agencies for all the acts and it drove the price up of all the acts to this astronomical price which is it's not just happening here it's happening all around the world but in australia it's things are so expensive visas flights accommodation especially sydney you know you guys know all about this it costs so much to bring an artist out and then our population's not really big enough to sustain all these costs and then when you throw in all the competition lack of venues you know it's just you know how many times have I played at a party where you know they've spent so much money on an international and it's just like not as busy as you would expect that it would be because it's just there's something else big on the same night you know and if you did that in Europe it wouldn't matter because there's enough people to go around but I think in like in Australia the population's smaller and especially during COVID when there was no new people coming in I think at the end of COVID, all of a sudden, it was like this big boom, everyone wants to party, but mm. then that kind of bubble burst like within a year and it's like whoever did parties in that year made some pretty good bank and like we were one of them, but then 
it was like after that, I had to try a lot harder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to get, you know, yeah. pull off what you did before because you're competing with big international lineups, and you know that shit's expensive. Like I think, yeah, I feel like there's just so much on, and if you're a punter. Now, but you might have had one or two friends that were doing parties. Now you've got three, four, five, and mixed in with big acts that you want to see, festivals, everything. It's like you can't afford to do every weekend out. So no, in general, like uh, that's the thing. I I can't, and so most people can't. Yeah, but you just can't. There's not mm. enough. See, in Europe, it doesn't matter because it doesn't matter if they go out every weekend because there's other people that are out. So there's enough people out every weekend. But in, in Australia, it's a smaller pool of people to work with. But I remember during COVID, like Ben Knott was one of the only ones who was ballsy enough to just keep doing all these boat parties in the middle of like COVID. And um, he got so much hate for it. But like, fuck, really? we had so much fun. Really? If, why do you get hate? Oh, because, you know, everyone was all, like, you know, at home on the um, Facebook or whatever, just like, oh, you Fucking know, the rules warriors. and, you know, this could be, like, yeah. oh, just, you know, the, the I always thought the whole thing was just so ridiculous, but obviously I learned not to say anything because everyone was just so opinionated about it. And, um, yeah, I just, like, we kept, he kept doing the parties and I kept playing them and it was just, like, such a nice release for all of us because it was, I mean, they were legal, but it was just people just were very opinionated about it. Well, shout out, Ben. Yeah, yeah, like, thank you, Ben, for <laughs> save, saving me during COVID. We had so much fun on those boats, man. Oh that was our, f- our first event was a boat, actually. Oh, yeah. 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 We had fucking no sit, idea about anything. Down. Which boat did you use? Moonlight. Was it? No, Moonlight was out. Oh, <laughs> Moonlight. Oh, that's that's right. Right. Say so <laughs> uh, Constellation. That's the one. Oh, yeah. That was close. I think uh, I know that one, yeah. With um, Maria. Maria. Yeah. 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 That was our first ever event. It's literally Cringe. no idea. And how was the turnout? Good. Sold out. Sold out. But oh, it, it, was, it was 150 people. Okay. Like, sit down. We couldn't have any more. But yeah, you couldn't have many around that time. sit down one, though. You like know, this to be seated legally. And then sit down means? <laughs> and yeah, then whenever is. whenever someone would get up and like start dancing, the security guards would come around and be like, "No, like sit down." But that was what f- yeah. four years ago. Twenty twenty. Yeah, twenty twenty. Yeah, four years. No, twenty twenty one. True. Oh, yeah, yeah true. Yeah, Three years ago. that's crazy. But yeah, there's so like funny, photos of it? people like. Must have been a magic yeah, on a drop. There's like people like half out their chair jumping up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's a funny video of me playing a sash fight where like. um they made everyone sit down at the end of my set because we were coming too close to the shore. Oh, yeah. oh, and then, like, right when the thing dropped, everyone just jumped <laughs> like crazy. You couldn't keep them down. I can't believe that was a thing. Yes. <laughs> it's pretty wild. Nuts. <laughs> so probably the biggest change in the scene, or at least I think that really shifted how everything operated in Sydney and New South Wales was lockout laws. How do you feel that, like, what changes have you seen since lockout laws in the scene? Uh, I mean, it was pretty bad when it first happened because I was a resident of Spice, which was an after-hours club, essentially. And then obviously when the lockout was started, that killed that after-hours culture because, you know, you couldn't get in anywhere after one. And that was the beauty of Spice was that it was all these different people from different scenes, different walks of life, fashion. Like, you know, if you've lived in Sydney a long time like me, you know, you know all these different groups of people from, but they're all from different scenes. But then if you have a cool after-hours club, they all end up there at the end of the night and it's, like, kind of really cool like that. Um, So it brings everyone together. But, yeah, the lockout laws kind of killed that whole culture. But now I feel like now it's actually good for me because it's like now the peak set is pretty much between 12 and 2 and Mm. I can kind of still get to bed at a reasonable time when I play in Melbourne it's like peak sets like yeah three to five and it's like you basically have to have a hotel room for two Mm. nights or you have to kind of have someone to stay with that doesn't mind if you're going to be sleeping all day you know it's like so yeah it's funny it's it's actually kind of good for me now that the way that it's shifted everything earlier because I can have a bit more of a normal life. But um, I really like that after hours sound, which is a different kind of sound. And that sound doesn't really exist as much in Sydney anymore. So when I played for those uh, the Umbrella Party up in um, Canberra a few weeks ago, it was me, Parker and Nick Reverse, and we ended up 
just all going back to back and we were playing that old school after hours sound from like, you know, the late 2000s, like 2009, 2010 and we all had these cool old after hours you like, you know, like deep rolling tech bombs, you know, yeah, like they're yeah. like, they're like rolling tech groovers but they've got big build offs and they just drop back into a groove, you mm. know, and yeah. um, we were all kind of trying to outdo each other with who's <laughs> got the cool oldest <laughs> bomb and it was so fun because up there I think they were, um, they into that sound i don't know like it seemed i think maybe they were all on mgma i don't know what was going on but they were like into it whereas like you can't really play that sound as much in sydney Mm because i don't think that people are on mgma or they're not or they're not the culture just doesn't exist anymore they want it faster and they want it to go off more and they're more impatient and you know you can still throw a few in but you can't play like a whole set like that Mm. yeah so you know how people talk about like the glory days of the cross and stuff like that. Was the cross still thriving up until the lockout laws? Because uh, we, we just missed. Not like, really. Um, so it was sort of struggling a bit, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, it was, it was kind of going more commercial around that time um, because, yeah, because at one stage Spice was at the Burdekin, which was in the cross, and then um, they got pushed out. I can't remember why. And then they moved to Martin Place. Uh, no, I feel like the cross was going more commercially around that time anyway. So the cross was kind of bigger, like maybe like a few years earlier. Because they were already trying to like regulate everything in the cross around mm. that time. And I think they were making it difficult for that after hours culture to exist there. Because they mm. were trying to, I think they had, the plans were already in place of like what they wanted to do, like, you know, make bank off the real estate or whatever. And they were already kind of trying to phase it out. Do you feel like back in the day when the cross was thriving, there's more opportunities for DJs because it was more like staple clubs and staple nights? Um, yeah, I, I, I actually believe there's always opportunity everywhere. It's all just like I believe in like the law of attraction. So I think it's like if you believe there's opportunity for you, there will be opportunity for you. If you believe there's not, there won't be. Like if you're coming at something from a place of lack, then that's what you're going to attract. So I feel like you attract what you put out. Like if you, like like I said before, if you're giving back to the scene and you're going to the parties and you're supporting people and you're being positive and being passionate and being genuine and enthusiastic, that's what you will get back. If you're just sitting there chin stroking and saying, oh, it's not like it used to be, you know, this and that, that's what you'll get back. You'll get back more of that. So I've never been like of that state of mind because, yeah, I've never never had a problem getting booked. Like I've always had bookings come through. Yeah, because I think people know that, I love it, you know, and I want to be there. It's not like a job for me. Like there are some gigs where you do it where you're like, oh, Jesus, you're a tough crowd. Like <laughs> <laughs> we've all been there. But um, but sometimes it's like you rock up and there'll be like no one there and then all of a sudden it can just, they can just come out of nowhere and it can end up being so amazing. And I've had so many like that and it's just, you just never know how it's going to go and you always have to go in with the right attitude no matter what because even if it doesn't get busy, like – What's the worst that's going to happen? You know, you have a few free drinks with the other DJs and promoters and you shoot the shit (laughs) and you talk about, you know, their life, what's going on in the industry. And that's also a positive thing too because you're getting quality time as opposed to trying to divide it between everyone else in the room. Yeah, Very good outlook, good attitude. All right, we're aware you have to shoot off to a gig in a minute, but thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, guys. And, yeah, so proud of everything you guys are doing. It's really cool building your own community, as we said. Slowly but shortly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See you soon. Rome yeah. wasn't built in a day. <laughs> <It's true. laughs> Thank you. Thanks, guys.